what is the animal's species specific diet? And the closer they are, the more exact they are with the animal's species specific diet, the better the nutritional profile of that meat is going to be, of that meat, the organs, et cetera, is going to be. And then obviously the more health benefits you're going to attain from that as well. And typically also the more sustainable the operation is going to be. And I'll explain why that's the case. Welcome to the Radical Health Rebel podcast. I'm your host, Lee Brandon. This work started for me several decades ago when I started to see the impact I could make on people, helping them to identify the root cause of their health problems that no doctor could figure out including serious back, knee, shoulder and neck injuries, acne and eczema issues, severe gut health problems, even helping couples get pregnant after several IVF treatments had failed. And it really moves me to be able to help people in this way. And that is why I do what I do and why we have this show. This week's episode entitled The Anti-Factory Farm Shopping Guide, I spoke with Eugene Trufkin, who grew up in the old Soviet Union, off-grid with his grandmother, who grew her own food. And we discussed his research into different farming methods, what the positives and negatives are of each farming method, the nutritional differences of the produce, and most importantly, what are the most and least healthiest options when buying food. Plus, we discussed the effects each farming modality has on the environment. Eugene's passion for farming techniques, the welfare of animals, and maximizing human health clearly shines through during this interview. Enjoy. Eugene Trofkin, welcome to the Radical Health Rebel podcast. Thanks for coming on the show. No, thanks for connecting, Lee. I know it's already been like probably nearing like a year, a year and a half since we've been going back and forth. My fault for bailing, I think, on one one of our appointments or something of that sort. I forgot exactly. But thanks for having me on. Uh, I know this. we've been communicating for a long time on like text messenger or messenger or whatever it's called, but it's good to um, finally see. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's a really important subject, I think, that, that we're going to talk about today. But before we dive into the nuts and bolts of that, to kick things off, could you share with the audience an overview of your own journey and, and really what led you to write the book, The Anti-Farm Factory Shopping Guide? Yeah. So for me, um, I know a lot of authors have this grand vision of like changing the world, but I honestly don't have like this huge purposeful mission. Uh, for me, it was just very simple. And it started as just a journey for myself and wanting um, very healthy eggs. I was actually born and raised. Um, now it's parts of Ukraine and Moldova. Back then it was the USSR still. And I lived kind of for many years in the USSR and then transitioned to Ukraine, then like parts of Moldova. But I, I spent a lot of those years living with um, with my grandmother. She was taking care of me, and she kind of lived pretty much off grid her entire life, and never really connected to um, to society for the better or worse, you know, maybe for the better. Uh, but uh, when I came to the U.S., I was just naive, and I thought um, everyone grew food the way my grandmother grew. Like I didn't even know what chemicals were, or antibiotics, or um, beta agonists, or steroids or the myriad of other uh, synthetic chemicals used in agriculture these days, at least in the US. And I'm pretty sure there's a lot of it that goes on in the UK and the EU as well, uh, just in any industrialized uh, any industrialized culture. And I, I never even knew any of this stuff existed. So when I would go to a, a grocery store, to me, it all, it all looked the same. I'm like, holy smokes, man, look how, um, how much food American farmers can grow organically and biodynamically. And can you imagine there's 50 eggs for like a dollar <laughs> fifty? No, that's like crazy. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, see, this is why US is like the best country in the world. You know, imagine like they can grow all this food uh biodynamically and stuff like that. So many, many years passed by and I ran into uh, nutrition, the dirt facts, uh by Polichek, hosted by Polichek. It's a very old video he did, but it's still on YouTube. And it is a really great resource for people um, that at least want to be more consciously aware of the difference. He used biodynamic as the gold standard compared to industrial agriculture, uh, which is common these days, but it's not normal. And I know it looks extremely fancy and well thought out with all the machines and all the spraying going on. And sometimes they even spray through airplanes and and this and that, it looks really well thought out, but that's actually not how farming is supposed to be done. And it's also especially important, not how farming is supposed to be done sustainably. 
And there's a huge issue with that as well. And um, so I watched that video and it's pretty long. You know, Paul Check's videos, they start with a minimum of like 300 hours and then kind of extend from there. But it was very informative. And um, then I'm like, oh, wait, you know, thinking in the back of my head, you're telling me all this food I've been buying, like at Costco, for example, or like these huge grocery store chains. Uh, by the way, a lot of the terminology I'm going to use may be more appropriate for a U.S. based audience. But I'll try to also um, give a lot of general advice and quick questions or things to look for that could be applied anywhere in the UK, anywhere in the world, if sourcing like high quality food is important for the person. And um, and I watched this video and I'm like, holy smokes, like uh, you're telling me all of this food in Costco isn't grown like the way my grandmother grew it, for example. And that's actually where all the confusion began, at least for a U.S. audience. It's it's very tough, especially with all the greenwashing, the different labels. It's very, very tough to actually find high quality food in the U.S., even when your intention is to do so. And um, so that's where my journey began. And my first goal was like, I just wanted healthy eggs, you know, like that my grandmother grew in, in the grocery store. And I'm like, well, this project is going to last like a few days, I'm going to go on Google and search something, and then I'll find what I'm looking for. And it turned out not to be the case. And even now, I'm pretty clear on where to buy food and what to look for and stuff of that sort. But it took me like a good four years of working on, you know, different farms. Uh, I worked on three or four different or four. Yeah, three or four different farms. Uh, one of them I even volunteered at for well over like a year interviewed various, just like what you're doing, interviewed various uh, leading people in the industry as well. And just obviously read like, you know, dozens and dozens of books on the material and stuff of that sort. But that's, that's how much work it took just to find like legitimate, healthy, actually, quote unquote, naturally grown food in the US. It's not as easy as people think. And um, even when the intention is to do so, for example, so that's kind of how I got into it. Uh, I just kind of started as just a project for myself. I just wanted healthy eggs, nothing more. And then once I started investigating and then kind of telling people about it and saying like, hey, there's a huge difference between cage, free, free range, pasture raised, and the myriad levels of integrity between each operation and how they're done. Um, and people became interested in it because they're like, oh man, I used to buy these cage free eggs thinking like, yeah, that they're out in, in pasture and being given like organic feed and fed a species specific diet, et cetera, et cetera. But it turned out not to be the case. And someone that's unknowingly does that could be doing that for their whole entire life, maybe spending a little bit more too, and not really getting what they, what they think they're getting, which is um, like what I like to refer to, although it's a greenwashed phrase, uh, phrase in the industry as well as, as natural food, but I mean, real genuine natural food with the minimal amount of farming as possible. Yeah, that's kind of what I was looking for. Right. And what what motivated you to to write the book? That that's what motivated me. I was looking I was looking just for eggs for uh, myself, and a lot of people were asking questions and stuff of that sort. My clients became interested in it as well, and I'm like, well, I might as well just write a book. I already have all the information. I had all the documents that I was keeping notes on, and um, it started off as like a 200 page book. But then I'm like, oh, I got to condense this and just make it way easier because one of my pet peeves about a lot of fitness or health or wellness books is the authors tend to go, um, they're, they're, the authors don't tend to put like quick action steps. Like here's what a realistic person can take minus all the fluff and the buildup and the story buildup. I know storytelling is fun, but I love as a reader, just like, hey, man, you have this problem. Here are the action steps you need to take to resolve the problem. Here's some video content, here's some pictures, and here's some uh, written text as well. And you usually combine those three and the person can understand what to do and kind of, as McGill would say, become their own mechanic over time, which is, which is the most important thing. So, so initially it started off really just your own self-interest and then that kind of grew and you kind of opened up a can of worms. It wasn't just eggs, it was, it was everything in the food supply. And then you realized, well, my clients need to know this information. And then it was, well, actually, everyone needs to know this information. So would that be right in, in terms of that? That's where the motivation for the for the book really came from is people need to know about this because most people don't know. 
Yes. And I would say this kind of information is moreover for the audience that is already wanting to make health conscious choices, but confused about how to go about doing so. You know, so the intention is already there. It's probably not for the audience that's um, highly addicted to like medical drugs and the whole symptom management, healthcare, and full of obesity and like misery and disease and stuff of that sort. Unfortunately, as Paul Chuck would say, and you know, the pain teacher hasn't come around quite often for them yet, you know? So for them, it's probably going to totally not be important. But for the audience that's interested in going on a real health journey, obviously, there's going to be more that they need to do than just improve their nutrition. But nutrition is going to be one of the main pillars that can have a huge positive cascade effect on all their biological markers, psychological markers as well. So it'd be it'd be very important for them to to know that and just learn how to source um, not only single ingredient foods, which are very important, but also single ingredient foods that are grown um, with the with the least amount of farming. I'm going to use that that kind of terminology because the less farming that goes on and the less humans interact with the food, it turns out the better it is. Ironically, you know. So there are some super legit biodynamic operations and stuff of that sort for sure. But um, it's usually not sold at a commercial level most of the time. We're just very inaccessible. Maybe some parts of Germany and stuff of that sort. Sure. Um, a, a term you've mentioned a couple of times, and just in case people don't know what it means, can you explain what greenwashing is? Yeah, greenwashing is um, making something sound healthy when it's not, you know? So a good example is, and uh, once again, let me know if this is also present in the UK, because I actually don't know the labeling laws in the UK and stuff of that sort. So a lot of times like greenwashing, perfect example is chicken is very popular in the US. I'm pretty sure it's a popular protein source in the UK as well. It's very kind of like inexpensive relative to a lot of the other protein sources. And on the label, oftentimes you'll see a couple of different labels that are representative of greenwashing. So the first one is vegetarian fed. And you'll see this typically like at the bottom, um, at the bottom of the label or usually kind of like in small print. And uh, because of Netflix, people, the general audience, maybe not someone like you, keep that in mind, the general audience, which is like basically 99% of the population, will see that and they're like, well, vegetarians are healthy. So these chickens are fed a vegetarian diet. So they must be healthy as well. That's the connection in the general customer's mind. But the problem is, especially when you've done any farming of your sort uh, or just studied husbandry practices with poultry, you'll see that, I'll just refer to them as chicken, are omnivores. They're not vegetarians, okay? So they eat, I mean, their preferred source of food is basically like worms, bugs, and stuff of that sort. And then they also eat, uh, you know, they could eat also as a supplementary feed grains and, and lettuce and all sorts of other stuff you give them. But their main, their main diet, their species specific diet, which is very important to understand, like what is the animal's species specific diet? And the closer they are, the more exact they are with the animal's species specific diet, the better the nutritional profile of that meat is going to be, of that meat, the organs, et cetera, is going to be. And then obviously the more health benefits you're going to attain from that as well. And typically also the more sustainable the operation is going to be. And I'll explain why that's the case as well. So when they see vegetarian fed, really what that means is, is grain fed. And that's it. So primarily the sources of grain are going to be corn and soy. And what happens is in that case, it's not a species specific diet. And when you feed hens, especially a tremendous amount of grain, which is pretty much all they're eating for the most part, what's going to happen is, is a few things happen. So first, the biggest one is the ratio to omega-3 to omega-6 is offset. So typically in a natural environment, if the animal was truly eating a species-specific diet, uh, it's going to probably be one-to-one omega-3 to omega-6 or maybe one-to-three or just maybe very close in general. But what happens when you feed them a tremendous amount of grain, which are going to be present in a lot of omega-6s, is it's going to shoot the omega-6 pretty high up in relation to omega-3, Okay which is in a sense going to cause the food to be pro-inflammatory or more inclined to cause inflammation in the body. And obviously, if people look up the inflammation theory of disease, they'll see that pretty much all disease arises from low-grade chronic inflammation throughout a person's life. It is important to do a side note. I mean, inflammation does occur from a myriad of reasons. 
injuries, infections, low grade mental chronic stress from like work, uh, pollution, uh, whatever, uh, toxic ingredients that you're putting on, uh, hygiene ingredients like deodorant, all that stuff. So, and typically these days, the toxic load or the total stress load on the person is quite a bit on the average person to cause quite a bit of inflammation in their body. Even training really hard will cause uh, inflammation in your body as well. So, so that that's one example of greenwashing. Another issue is uh, they're like, well, it's vegetarian fed. Okay, well, vegetarian fed means grain fed. And then you have to evaluate, well, how are all these grains grown? Well, let's take a look at that. So all grains, and this is the great thing with sustainable um, sustainability that a lot of vegetarians in the community preach. So they're like animal, um, animal meat operations aren't sustainable. And I would actually, for the most part, agree with them when it's a factory farmed operation. But I would like them to find like a single biodynamic operation that isn't actually replenishing the earth, moreover taking things from it. Okay, they're not going to, obviously. But let's take a look at um, what are the main sources of calories for vegetarians. Uh, they're like grains, beans, lentils, et cetera, et cetera. And how are all those grown? They're all grown in, in monocultures, monocropping, which is basically like the number one way to destroy the, the health of the soil uh, very, very quickly in short. And you got to go like, okay, so <clears throat> these uh, vegetarian fed hens are being fed corn and soy. How's corn and soy grown? Well, it's grown through a monoculture. Okay, so what is a monoculture? A monoculture is basically... Uh, when you're basically growing like a single crop for acre and acre and acre and acre. So just you'll see corn for endless amounts of acres. And I know that looks fancy because it's just so common and people are so used to just seeing that as the form of farming because it looks kind of advanced and industrialized. But really, that is the type of farming that is degrading the soil and just causing also just a tremendous amount of pollution because oftentimes not oftentimes, every time when you have a monoculture, you overemphasize the depletion of certain nutrients in the soil. Because I know the soil, for the most part, looks like very dead when you look at it, but it's actually extremely alive. If you especially look up the soil food web and kind of understand there, you have like a million bugs, bacteria, fungi, et cetera, et cetera. And when you grow a monocrop, because it overemphasizes the depletion of a certain nutrient that fuels that kind of crop, what ends up happening is the soil degrades over time. And because the soil is where the plant get, it gets its nutrients from, the plant eventually weakens because it's obviously not getting the right nutrition. And as the plant weakens, nature's way of getting rid of weak plants is to send in pests. Okay. And then pests come in. And then obviously, um, if the farmer it's not going to change their farming practices, which they're not because they're so heavily invested in all that land and all those contracts and all that machinery and all that chemical agriculture. And you're getting a lot of pest infestation. What's your, what's your only option is to use a lot of synthetic biocides like pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously when you spray all this stuff on there, it kills the bugs for sure right away, but then it also weakens the soil composition even more because unfortunately it just destroys all the good bacteria as well, which causes um, which causes a disruption in the natural ratio of bacteria to fungi to that specific crop. Then it causes a cascade effect down the entire soil food web, leaving even less nutrients for the next season. So because there are less nutrients for the next season, more pests come around. And what do you got to do? You got to use even more chemicals, you know, and then you could only do so many of these cycles before the soil is depleted completely. And then you don't even have any more farmable land. And just to give you people and uh, your audience an idea of why this is important to consider, if you look at an apple, um, I got this idea from someone, I forgot the author's name exactly. So definitely not my credit here. But if you look at an apple uh, and you shave off 70% of the surface volume of, the, uh, of that apple, that's ocean. So obviously you can't farm anything there, right? So you're left with 30%. Now out of that 30%, probably half of that is just not farmable due to one reason or, or another, like extreme climate, maybe it's too sloped, the soil is all messed up. So you're left with really about you know 15% or so. And out of that 15%, half of that area is about where all 
metropolitan areas are developed because they're all developed in very fertile land. Okay. And then you're really left with about 8% or so of the surface of the earth that's able to be farmed for food. And if a lot of these industrial operations, especially monocropping, are depleting that so quickly and so heavily, you can see where in the near future, if things don't change, I don't know if you know the movie Soiling Green, uh, one of my favorite movies, but um, basically there aren't, there isn't going to be, uh, there's going to be a lot of food scarcity and stuff of that sort. And um, Soiling Green is a is a great movie for people to watch. It's basically the earth ran out of food and people were being fed soy soy crackers. But it turns out the soy crackers were just made up of um, like old people, the deceased, and they were recycled and formed into soy crackers. And then people were eating us. Anyways, one guy uncovered it and tried to expose it, but nobody believed him. You know, <laughs> and I think they ended up actually killing him at the end and just the whole thing kept going on. Uh, which is kind of maybe a little bit symbolic of what's going on now with all the fake meats and um, the push for vegetarian diets, which once again, uh, don't even listen to me. Don't even listen to Lee for your audience. Just go find a single biodynamic operation that actually depletes the soil and doesn't replenish the soil. You won't be able to do it. And all those biodynamic operations include a myriad of different uh, a myriad of different animals on their operation. The animals actually help put that natural fertilizer and other nutrients back into the soil, will, which which help it grow. So, for example, I did that. Uh, I listed that example of you know vegetarians growing, relying on a bunch of grains and a lot of monocropped uh, crops for their calorie intake, uh, which are definitely not sustainable to produce and definitely destroy the earth quite a bit. But look at cattle operation. You know, legitimate. 100% grass-fed cattle operation, like some good examples, some great resources uh, for your audience are americangrassfed.org. You can go on that website. It's a huge interactive map. It is a U.S. company, of course, but at least they can see examples of what it looks like. Number five, bar beef uh, is a great example too. I worked there with Frank Fitzpatrick. He's a regenerative cattle op operator, and he's been doing it for 30 years, and he's actually had the same heard since the beginning. And basically, he doesn't use any uh, vaccines, beta agonists, steroids, antibiotics. His cattle are always very, very healthy and strong and muscular. And what he did was basically in the initial herd, the ones that couldn't survive in that environment, he didn't treat them at all. He would just let them die out. And only the strong ones were able to stay alive and breed and form cattle that were able to really excel in that specific environment. So now they're super healthy, very durable, and their genetic line is is very strong as well, which is which is very important to consider. And uh, on top of that, when you're looking at cow operations, so they're like, oh, you know, I get a lot of uh, vegetarians. That it's not it's not uh, sustainable. Well, let's look at it. So you got uh, just in short. Let's say you have a herd of cattle. They usually clump up. They never spread apart. So first of all, they don't even take up that much land because they kind of are shoulder to shoulder all the time. Whenever you even they can be on open pasture of like a million acres. And they will still be shoulder to shoulder together. That's just how they how they move and navigate. Uh, in a, exactly. So it's not like they're taking up a crazy amount of land to begin with, you know. So they're shoulder to shoulder, and they eat a bunch of. They rely on grass. Their species specific diet is that of a herbivore. So they eat grasses and other forages like alfalfa, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and which we can't eat and convert to calories. So that's important to consider too. And the good thing is. Uh, with the right atmosphere, just that stuff, that feed is for free. It grows on its own. And on top of that, as the cattle eat uh, this grass, they also poop, they pee there, they kind of use their hooves to stump in a lot of nutrients into the soil. They also lay down on the soil, which helps them, which uh, helps put the nutrients back into the soil, et cetera, et cetera. And as they're done grazing, let's say acre A, you transition them to acre B. And then acre C and acre D. And by the time they're done with acre D, acre A has already grown back because of the fertilizer they put in there through their manure. And thus, they even create their own food, which doesn't require external inputs, which is important because factory farms, especially these vegetarian kind of fed label farms, do require external inputs. Because when you see free range on the label and then you see vegetarian fed down below, 
that doesn't make any sense and is, is a huge red flag already because if they're like the hens, for example, if they're truly free range, they would be outside eating bugs. So they wouldn't be vegetarians, right? Uh, so when it says vegetarian fed and when it says free range, what free range is another greenwashing label means is you have a huge barn with a little kind of smoke pit type area that's fenced off that the hens typically go outside in. And uh, because meat chickens, especially, you know, they're like six to 12 weeks max from start to finish. So they're very young and they're very suspicious of any lights. So they really don't even go outside. So if you go to any of these free range operations, it's rare. Now there are some great ones, no absolutes. I'm not throwing everyone out of the board, but usually like 98% of the stuff you especially find at the supermarket falls under the category I'm describing here, kind of a lot of greenwashing. Uh, you go to these operations and almost none of them are outside. All of them are inside because the doors are usually pretty open and the light is pretty intense when it comes in from the outside. So they're very standoffish and scared of it. So when the hens obviously can't go to the food, the farmer has to bring the food to the hens. And what's the most economical feed that gets them to grow the fastest? Because it's a pound per pound industry, right? It's, it's grains. Because in the US especially, I don't know how it is in the UK, but grains are heavily subsidized. And the cost of a meat operation is 80% feed. So that's the biggest cost of the entire operation. So if you can get the government to subsidize that, you can see why you're incentivized to do it that way. Uh, because they'll save you a tremendous amount of money and actually increase your profit margins quite a bit. So once again, then the farmer has to bring the food to the hens and they have to rely on all these monocrop operations, which we described the problems there. And it's not a sustainable way of farming for sure. Another issue is monocropping depletes the nutritional profile of the crop, like we mentioned. So if the hens aren't eating, aren't getting the nutrients from the crops, it's not like the hens can make the nutrients out of nothing. So once again, the nutrients aren't found in the meat, then you would eat it and you're being deprived of those nutrients as well. And I know some people would be like, um, oh, you know, it's like, whatever, I've been eating this factory farm stuff for a while and I'm completely fine. But I highly doubt that, especially in the US with nine out of 10 Americans right now being metabolically sick. That's 90% of the population. And by 2030, it's estimated that 50% of the op population will not only be overweight, they'll be obese. And if you count obese and overweight, it's close to 85 to 90% of the operation. This is for sure due to eating excess calories in relation to activity level. That's the biggest variable for sure. But also is just the whole entire belief, pathological belief system that has normalized just that kind of uh, living standards that led to a that obesity, which usually inclines a person to pick the cheapest food possible, which goes under these factory farmed operations, processed food, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, obviously, if the hens aren't getting those nutrients from the feed, you're not going to be getting it. And um, if you're nutrient deficient, you know you're missing parts to a vehicle. Obviously, the vehicle may not break right away, but it will break down eventually. And unfortunately, these days in society, it's like, uh, it's it's co so common to be sick, people don't even see anything wrong with it, which is which is another uh, topic that may be discussed like another day. But does that answer it, Lee? I feel... Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, one thing just to add to that is that, you know, if you're eating animals that have been fed nutrient-depleted plants then you're going to be nutrient depleted. If you're nutrient depleted, you're going to be hungry. You're going to eat more food. So you're going to eat more calories yes. because you're eating poor quality. And I think that's a, that's something that a lot of people don't quite understand is that by actually eating higher quality food, you actually don't need to eat so much to feel full. And I remember when I first started eating organic food, must be must be 23 years ago now, I probably dropped my food intake by about 30 percent just by switching to purely organic food because my body was getting more nutrients i didn't need to eat as much sharon a 52 year old business consultant came to see me because she was waking up every night and not able to get back to sleep leaving her exhausted during the day which was very concerning for sharon she occasionally had a dull ache in her stomach 
and she also suffered from acne. But Sharon was most desperate to get to the bottom of her sleep issue. Following a series of tests, it was found that Sharon had a gut infection, which was the likely cause of her waking at night and causing the stomach ache. And she also had a leaky gut and food sensitivities, which may have played a role in her acne. Sharon went on a low FODMAP diet and supplementation plan to rebalance her gut microbiome and help repair her gut lining and to support her immune system. Within days, Sharon felt much better. Within weeks, Sharon was sleeping through the night, her stomach ache vanished, her skin was clear, her energy levels increased, and her weight, particularly around her middle, in her own words, simply dropped off. If you're suffering with sleep, gut, or skin issues, and want to get to the root cause, and you'd like to achieve a great result just like Sharon, then go to www.bodycheck.co.uk, that's B-O-D-Y-C-H-E-K.co.uk, to request your consultation. Now, back to the podcast. Just want to um, go into a little bit more detail on something that you've, you've already touched on so far. And that's, can you explain the difference between factory farmed, organic and biodynamic fruits and vegetables? Yes. And um, once again, US audience here, so I'm not putting down the UK food system. EU is probably a little bit better, but honestly, probably not that much better probably, overall, you know? Yeah. Is it is it a lot better? You know, you know probably better than I do there. I went to Germany and they did have um I think it was called Biomart. It was like an organic store. I probably am getting this name wrong. And they did have biodynamic food there for sure, which I was in awe of because you'll never find that anywhere in the US, even at higher end places like Whole Foods. Uh natural grocers is is pretty good. They do have selections in that category. Uh but once again, natural grocers here, it's kind of a you're not going to find them in a lot of places in the U S so, um, biodynamic farming, like I mentioned in the beginning of the call is more popular in the, in, uh, in the EU. So yes, that's important to consider. So first of all, like these days, unfortunately, and once again, no absolutes, it doesn't apply to every single company, but I would say 90% of the time when you see USDA or organic, label or like the organic label, which kind of basically means the same thing. It means 95% of the ingredients should be or organic in that produce or whatever. Um, it mostly means what I refer to as industrial organic. So it's basically like that operation I told you about, like that monocropping operation, but they just use organically approved biocides. When I say biocides, I'm talking about like uh, herbicides, pesticides, Redentocide, whatever. There are almost 2,000 different chemicals used in agriculture to give you uh, an example of how extensive that industry uh, that industry is. And I forgot exact the total amount of billions of pounds of all these chemicals that are poured into the soil every year. And I think in the US, I remember, I got to double check this, but I remember, I think like 80% of the rainwater has trace amounts of glyphosate in it, you know, just to give you an idea. And it's kind of become to the point of, where you have to go on websites to know even where you can safely fish. You know, the sad truth of that is it's like you can't even safely fish wild fish, which is supposed to be like the apex of food production, basically, and be uh, be safe about eating that stuff every day, et cetera, et cetera. So most often than not, when you see that organic label, it it really just probably is industrial organic. I think it is still a huge upgrade from the non-organic label because at least you're not dealing with a lot of those synthetic biocides and the USDA organic label here for fruits and vegetables doesn't allow GMO products either, which is a huge plus too, because a lot of those GMO products, especially for example, corn is grown with a lot of Roundup, which its main active ingredient is a glyphosate, that chemical I just mentioned in the rainwater, uh, which supposedly through FDA testing said, They'll never be persistent in the environment, which is what they say with every single com uh, chemical, and then it ends up being in the environment any anyways. But I don't know how safety testing is done in the UK, but in the US, um, this is another form of greenwashing. I refer to it as greenwashing because 
a lot of people are like, oh, you know, who cares? It's just a little bit that they're spraying on there. First of all, it's not a little bit. If you go on any of these operations, they're most always using way higher doses than they're supposed to even for what that chemical is tested to be safe at. Let's make that clear. Anyone that's worked on or gone to any of these operations, that's most always the case. Second, it's the testing is wishy-washy, in my opinion, as well, because they never test the complete formulation for safety. So you would think as a general consumer, they take a complete product, like what you find at the store, what you would spray in your garden, and they spray it on there, then they kind of feed it to some animals or whatever, and then they see if it's safe. But it's not the case. What happens is, and how it's done, is any chemical formulation is divided into two branches of chemicals. First, you have two branches of ingredients. So first, you have the active ingredient, which is kind of like the main player. And then you have a bunch of inert or inactive ingredients, which are put there to help increase the lifespan of the chemical or help increase the durability so that rainwater doesn't wash it away or help increase the lethality, kind of keep the chemical staying alive longer. And what testing requires is just to test the inactive ingredient in isolation on its own. So it's not even tested as a complete formulation. So that's one huge problem. A second huge problem is no farmer just uses one chemical on a crop. It's usually done in a combination of chemicals depending on the season as well. Uh, Third problem is all the chemical testing, the safety testing is done in-house by the scientists that are hired by the chemical companies to do this testing, and then they send these tests to the FDA for approval. Okay. Another issue is, first of all, no one has ever done, because it's basically impossible to do safety testing on, on what happens when a person has a cocktail of chemicals in their body at all times, which is the case. Like the average newborn born in a metropolitan area in the US right now has trace amounts of 200 different synthetic chemicals in their body already from food, the environment, et cetera, from the plastics, et cetera, et cetera. And they're starting their life like that. And their metabolism is not obviously going to be as great to process out a lot of these chemicals as like a 200 pound male, grown male, for example. So you can see there are a lot of issues there that a lot of people, it just goes under the radar because of course, a lot of people are busy for sure. They don't have time to think about all this stuff. And they have a lot of these government agencies. In the US, I do think they're great at stopping things that kill you right away. I do actually think they're actually pretty damn good at that. But they're beyond terrible at taking into consideration what's going to happen to you, like medium term even, or long term for sure. So in my opinion, like what I do is I just go, I got this from Jator Pierre. I know you know who that is. Uh, guilty until proven innocent when it's in your food, when it's regarding to your food supply. Okay. And if you look at the history of chemical manufacturing, it always goes through the same similar stages. This chemical is totally safe. It's been proven a million times over that it's safe. 20 years goes by. Oh, actually it's not safe. Let's ban it. And then a new chemical comes out. This is totally safe. Uh, let's it's, it's totally okay. It's not going to be in the environment. 20 years goes by. Ah, actually, it, it causes cancer. Okay, let's get rid. And it's like over and over. They don't even change their game plan anymore because people are, they're just totally not paying attention. And it goes back to the big issue of uh, normalized pathology in modern culture. Just, it's become totally normal to be on a bunch of medical drugs, obese, miserable, overworked over caffeinated or whatever other stimulants people are using in front of your computer 10 hours a day. And of course, when people, uh, sick people, like I say, can't make healthy decisions or they wouldn't be sick to begin with. So when you're operating from that belief system, of course, all of this is, is normal, you know, but it's totally not normal. I highly encourage people to kind of step back and just look at the level of, of pathology that has been normalized in culture today and question it heavily because it's totally not benefiting the majority of people. So so how do people buying food, how do they choose? So let's put it this way. If you, if you had to explain to a 10-year-old what the difference was between factory farmed organic and biodynamic fruits and vegetables, how would you, how would you describe it to a 10-year-old? So um, one other important thing I would like to mention 
is um, at least or this isn't actually allowed in the EU. I know for sure, but in the US, uh, hydroponic operations could sell their produce as organic as well, which is super crazy because you think organic it needs soil. Because I mean, think about it. Use common sense. There's a little bit of debate. You know how old the universe is? Let's just say 14 billion years. You know, it took 14 billion years for the universe to form. It took like 5 billion years or so for the earth to form the type of soil composition that's present today to be able to give rise to the type of crops we see today. And um, hydroponics is like, well, we know better than 14 billion years of evolution because we've only been here for like 30, 40 years. And we're going to get rid of the soil completely, which is the number one way the crop gets its nutrients. We're going to put it into this uh, hydroponic operation. It could actually be outside, but it could be in containers as well. We're going to put it into these containers, and it's going to look like a matrix lab, basically. And we're going to have IV drips, dripping synthetic nutrients into the crop to be able to get them to grow more, and then sell them that way, You know, presuming that it's going to have the right nutrition. I think there is actually a place for hydroponics um, in the initial stages of colonizing other planets. If that's the case, you know, if that ever happens, I think that would be a cool technology to incorporate there. So once again, no absolutes to anything I'm saying. There's a place and time for everything. I'm just saying there's also that greenwashing there. It's saying it's organic. You know, it has a picture of a farm with soil. But once you see it in real life, you're like, yeah, these are containers with artificial lights, artificial nutrients, no soil. And obviously, you're not going to get the same nutritional profile in that crop. And I think also there's so much room left to study all of the myriad of nutrients in any food. I think there are billions of them that we haven't even discovered yet, you know, that are totally being missed and left out by these kind of farming operations. So the biggest, I mean, to go back, not to get distracted too much, and I would like to also include some cool thing after bio, after explaining the biodynamic farming, but the cool thing is um, the big difference between biodynamic farming is and industrial organic is industrial organic is just that. It's say you got one guy just growing carrots and you'll see um, acre and acre and acre after carrots. You know, he's just growing like, he's like specializing in just carrot production, which doesn't make it better. You think specialist is better, but really, once again, you're not supposed to grow things in monocropping. It destroys the soil. The crops lack nutrients. There are a lot of chemicals that need to be used. Once again, those chemicals make it into the nutritional profile of the crop that you can't wash off either. Because a lot of the chemicals are meant to be systemic. So they get soaked up by the root of the plant and get embedded into the actual fibers of the actual food. And there's no washing that off, no peeling off the surface, et cetera, et cetera. You're for sure eating that stuff. And biodynamic, you have a bunch of animals and you're rotating them with a crop, rotating crop system as well. So once again, these it's more self-sustaining, Okay. These animals are helping put, putting nutrients back into the soil, which the crops rely on, because unlike animals, the crops can't move. So they, they're limited to their root system. And basically, the bacteria and fungi around that, which kind of give rise to the entire soil, soil umbrella of food web, basically. And that's, that's the biggest difference. And obviously, when you're growing healthy plants, you don't need chemical agriculture because once again, nature's way of getting rid of weak uh, plants is to send in pets. So as long as your plants are healthy, they're nice and uh, fertile, then those pests aren't going to come around anyways. So obviously the nutritional profile is going to be a lot better of the crop, but also just another thing to consider, it depends on what kind of, um, I guess you can say breed they're using of the vegetables because this is another huge issue. And I think uh, there's this book, um, I forgot the name, name of it already, but uh, basically uh, what a lot of people don't realize is there has been a lot of natural genetic manipulation of crops over the years. So the crops you see today at the grocery store are usually a far cry from what you're going to see of their wild ancestors, right? Let's take a carrot for a good example. Everyone has eaten carrots before. So a carrot actually started as like a gray root in Afghanistan many thousands of years ago. Then slowly, it kind of traveled to India through genetic manipulation. It became purple. Then, you know, hundreds of years later, it traveled to China where it became red. Then hundreds of years later, it traveled to Turkey where it became yellow. Then hundreds of years later, it traveled to, I believe, Denmark where it became orange. And today we know carrots is orange. 
But actually, their Far Cry ancestor is basically like a gray root in Afghanistan. And through genetic manipulation, which basically favors thinner skin, higher sugar content at the expense of phytonutrients, phytonutrients being those important nutrients you need to sustain health and life, et cetera, et cetera. So to give you an idea, orange carrots have a decent amount of nutrients as well, but uh, an orange carrot has basically no anticyanins, where a purple carrot, which is luckily still accessible at the grocery store, has like 900% more typically anticyanins, which are good anti-cancer phytonutrients versus an orange carrot. My point being, though, I think all vegetables are great to have, you know, if your digestion can uh, handle it, et cetera, et cetera. My point being is a lot of people are just totally unaware that that kind of level of manipulation has happened to everything they're seeing in the grocery store as well. And unfortunately, it happens in favor of more sugar, in favor of thinner skin at the expense of phytonutrients. Um, then there's also the issue of uh, the crop is usually picked before it ripens, right? And the ripening process is how the crop attains all the nutrients. So that way it can ripen on the way to the grocery store. And that way it can kind of be fresh and, and look firm for you to purchase, increase the chances of you purchasing it, obviously. Uh, but the problem with that is now you're having crops grown in a monocrop, which already decrease the nutrient profile quite a bit. They're picked before they ripen, which decrease the nutrient profile even more. Then there's the transit time. As you pick them out of the ground and rip them out of the root, they start dying, right? Just like anything else. So it might be like two, three, four weeks uh, by the time it lands to the grocery store. Then it's in the grocery store for a week. Then you pick it up. It's at it's on your counter for a few days. Then you end up eating it. By that point, it's pretty much like you're just eating water and some fiber content. And it's... Um, uh, it is going to be much lower nutrients versus like you go wild foraging and you pick up a crop and you eat it right away. It's going to be packed with way more nutrients, way more phytonutrients. Yeah. So if someone, let's say, let's say they're on a budget, what would your advice be to them in terms of buying fruits and vegetables? If they're on a budget, then the best thing to do is to to buy fruits and vegetables and actually single ingredient food. In the U.S., probably the same thing in Western Europe. A lot of people has been have been brainwashed to believe what's not important is important, and what's important is no longer that important. You know, so they would go out of their way to buy like an expensive car or their new iPhone, but then penny pinch on organic food. You know what I mean? And then wondering why they look terrible have all sorts of diseases, skin issues, et cetera, et cetera. So the U.S., for example, the average American spends eight to $16,000 a year on non-essential expenses. This includes eating out, alcohol, uh, travel, this new iPhone, je like designer jeans or whatever, just stuff that's maybe giving you a sugar high at best, maybe. And then that's it. The, the money's gone, of course, and doesn't come back. So eight to $16,000 a year, no problem. And they wouldn't even question this most of the time. Because once again, like I told you, sick people can't make healthy decisions or they wouldn't be sick to begin with. And nine out of 10 people right now in the US are very sick. So a 2,000 calorie organic diet, single ingredients and grocery store level diet, it's going to run you about like 5,000 a year. So uh, the people that say they can't afford it, they can't afford this eight to $16,000 a year of non-essential expenses, but will turn around and tell you they can't afford $5,000 for organic food, which may be the case because they spent it all on all that BS, basically distraction activities, you know, uh, constantly seeking external fulfillment, which doesn't lead to any lasting fulfillment pretty much ever. And uh, so there's a good example. Uh, honestly, I mean, just go look at what a whole chicken would cost. Or what single ingredient like steak, broccoli would cost, or carrots, you know, or actual real food, it's very, very low. Uh, I mean, 2,000 calories, you're looking at, you know, like 100 bucks a week, which is, which is not that much. For sure, there are some people that can't even afford that, but it's far in between. Most people can't afford that. I even, um, from time to time, I help a friend with one of his construction projects, and he's kind of like, you know like a poor neighborhood and I go to the grocery store there. It's like, Heb. And you do see a lot of people there are financially struggling, but you look at their shopping cart, it's full of like chips, ice cream, 
you know, bottled water in plastic, like all those little teeny bottled waters too. And you look at the bill, it's like, it's like a lot, especially if you consider the amount of volume of food you get in return. So like two potatoes cost nothing. It's like pennies. But a bag of potatoes, which is made out of those two potatoes, it's like five bucks. You know what I mean? So they are, they do have the money. It's just, once again, sick people can't make healthy decisions or they wouldn't be sick. And unfortunately, a lot of times they're even funding their own pathology unknowingly. I mean, one of the things that, that I discussed in a, in a solo podcast I did a few weeks back was that, you know, first of all, if you ate higher quality food, number one, you wouldn't need to eat so much. Yes. And if you cut out all the snack foods, like you were saying, potato chips, you know, in the sweets, the candies, all that kind of stuff, ice cream, you wouldn't, you wouldn't need, to, you, you could possibly even eat, eat a higher quality um, food. You can actually potentially spend less if you just choose, you know, as you said, choose single ingredient foods, right? And actually do something that's really novel these days, actually do some cooking rather than buy it all pre-packaged and put it in the microwave, right? Mm -hmm. You know, to actually cook. I mean, I'm, I'm no chef, but I can cook my own meals. You know, it's not that difficult to learn. Um, so yeah, that's some good advice there. We've spoken a little bit about chicken already. And, it, and yeah, you're right. It's very popular in the UK, just, just as it is in most of the Western world. But can you explain, you know, you, you, you mentioned it a little bit, but can you explain the different ways in which chickens are raised and what are the most and least healthiest options? Julie, a 47-year-old who works in computer sales, came to see me complaining of lifelong irritable bowel syndrome, which included severe abdominal pain and bloating, loose and very frequent stools, along with hot flushes, menstrual brain fog, and low energy, which affected her work performance. After taking a comprehensive history, plus running some labs, I discovered that Julie had a parasite infection, which may have been causing the loose stools, a methane-producing bacterial overgrowth that was almost certainly causing the abdominal bloating and pain, a leaky gut, low levels of digestive enzymes, as well as eating too many high oxalate foods on her vegetarian diet. So Julie reduced the high oxalate foods from her diet, plus she took a broad-spectrum antimicrobial supplement to help with the parasites and the bacteria in her gut, probiotics to increase her good bacteria and help repair her gut lining. She also took prebiotics to help feed the commensal bacteria, digestive enzymes to improve her, her digestion, and herbs to help clear the toxic lipopolysaccharides from her system produced by the overgrowth of gram-negative bacteria. At the end of the program, Julie reported that her health had never been better. In her own words, the improvement is staggering. The abdominal pain and bloating was gone. Her stools were back to normal. Her energy was up. She no longer had brain fog or hot flashes, and her immune system had improved as she no longer suffered from frequent bugs and colds. If you're suffering like Julie was and you want to get to the root cause of your problem, you can arrange a consultation with me at bodycheck.co.uk. That's B-O-D-Y-C-H-E-K. And if we're a good fit, I could help you achieve the same kind of results as Julie. Now, back to the podcast. Yeah, so in the US, you have um, four distinct categories. Uh, actually, three distinct categories with meat chickens, four with uh, egg egg laying hens. So with meat chickens, three categories. So you got the cage free, which I would stay away from. That's basically like a enclosed barn. They never go outside, right? They're under artificial lights. They're just fed a bunch of GMO grains. Also in their water, uh, they just have antibiotics in the water, actually. So they're constantly exposed to antibiotics as well. So one issue I have is a lot of people are like, ah, uh, like in America, especially the you get an average person that's like on four different pharmaceuticals directly and they're like, ah, I don't want my chicken to have antibiotics. I'm like, dude, you're on four pharmaceuticals directly. You know, <laughs> let's, let's work on getting off of that. So I have an issue. Once again, sick people can't make healthy decisions. And I feel the level of health has become delusional, at least in the U S uh, for the most part. And so you got the cage free barn enclosed 
uh, chemically treated GMO grains fed to these animals, not a species specific diet. I'll definitely stay away from that. Then you got the free range, which is uh, for the most part, in most cases, not every case, pretty much the same as the cage free. They're pretty much the same. Then you have the pasture raised option. Uh, now, there are various levels of integrity of pasture raised, right? So you got to keep that into consideration, be flexible there. But at the grocery store level, that one's going to be far better off usually than the other ones. A lot of, like um, the square footage of space per hen in like a cage free and a free range operation is about like two square foot of space per hen. So you're looking at a pasture raised operation. Typically, it's about 10 square feet of space per hen. Not crazy, but it's still kind of a lot more. Uh, and then some operations, like I volunteered to learn about um, regenerative poultry operations at happy-hens.com. So um, there's this, I forgot exactly, I think 220 square feet of space per hen. Okay, it's been like a few years since I worked there, obviously. Uh, they don't feed their hens corn and soy. Okay, and they're outside twenty four seven, and they rotate them. Def, uh, they rotate them daily onto new pasture. This is important because you don't want a lot of stocking density in your hens because they eat up all the worms, and that that way there's less worms per hen, etc. So you have to have more feed, and you don't want to keep them on the same piece of land. So you want to rotate them often, and that's going to basically be dependent on the type of land you're dealing with, plus your stocking density of your herd. So the bigger the stocking density, typically the more often, the faster you have to rotate them. So 220 square foot of space, no corn and soy, plus daily rotation, that's going to be the optimum. Um, a lot of times too, people get non-GMO confused with organic. Non-GMO simply just means that it's a non-genetically modified seed but it could still be grown with a lot of synthetic biocides, which once again are systemic and tend to get soaked up by the root of the crop and make it into the nutritional profile of the crop, which then the hens end up eating and it bioaccumulates into the tissue of the hens. And then you end up eating that, that meat or that egg, uh, whichever uh, issue. And another issue with stocking density that's a bit under the table and a lot of people don't look at it as well is uh, when you jam pack animals into a confined operation, it causes various issues. So the most obvious one is the animals tend to be more stressed. And when the animal is under higher stress, their li liver tends to release too many serum amyloid A proteins. And those, when not metabolized because they're released in excess, for, uh, break off into amyloid A proteins, which form as plaque on the organ tissue and to a smaller extent, the muscle tissue of the organism. Uh, and that plaque is not able to be metabolized. And then obviously humans are eating that as well. Uh, it's most often present in animals that have that allow a longer lifespan. So for example, egg laying hens, it's about two years, you know, or cattle, it's about like a year or two years, depending on the operation, et cetera, et cetera. So with like a broiler chicken, because the turnaround time is quite fast, you might not have a lot of amyloid A buildup there for sure, but that's yet to be known. So I don't think anyone has really tested the duration of life with animals, et cetera, et cetera, in regards to amyloids. Also, when you jam pack them in these facilities, obviously there's a lot of bacteria and their immune system is constantly stressed trying to fight all this off. And that also releases more serum amyloid A proteins from the liver. Also, Various vaccines given to the animals release amyloid A proteins from the liver as well due to overstressing the central nervous system. Um, so stuff like that. So that's an important thing to consider as well. So obviously when they're having more space, once again, the key thing, like I mentioned in the beginning, is we want to get away from human interaction with the food, right? The more natural, the more species-specific the food is, the more natural the crop is grown, the better off you're going to be personally. So, um, so that's the difference between uh, between those operations. Some great websites are like eatwild.com. Once again, more of an American-based website, but again, anyone can use those as a resource of what to look for because farming practices are going to be the same pretty much from continent to continent. So that way you have the answers. 
and you can become your own mechanic and find your own solution without needing to always seek outside advice. Yeah. So the um, the farm he was working on, the, the chickens that had the 200 square feet per hen, were they just literally eating wh- whatever was in the environment, whether it was worms or bugs or, or whatever? They weren't actually being fed by the farmer. They were literally living off the land, so to speak. Yeah, that's a good question. And when you're uh, dealing with a commercial operation, you're not going to be able to do that. You will be able to do that if you had your own little coop, you know, just for yourself and maybe your wife or something like that. And uh, and you had enough land and also fertile land. That's important too. It's not like a desert or anything of that sort. So they did supplement with grains, barley, for example, um, sesame seeds. I forgot exactly what they put in their mix. Every farmer has their own like special blend uh, that's required for their specific operation. Uh, they just didn't supplement with corn and soy, yeah. which is which is very common. That's pretty much the majority of, of feed is composed of soy and corn. Yeah, I was just I was wondering because I was thinking about this the other day. I was just wondering, <laughs> would it be possible? Because that's what I thought. I thought they probably wouldn't be able to survive in large numbers from from the environment. And I was wondering if it was feasible for the farmer to feed them worms and bugs and things like that. Economically, probably not. That's kind of what I was thinking. Yeah, probably not. But if you do it on your own, it's easy to do that. Also, you can feed them like dead carcasses. They'll even eat that, you know. Uh, Remember, they're omnivores. So they like protein sources of meat, you know, worms, bugs. Once again, they'll chew on uh, organs and stuff of that sort. Uh, I would would imagine imagine if you were a worm, a chicken would look like a T-Rex. Oh, yeah, probably even more massive. It would be and, terrifying. And just, I don't know if worms have eyes, though. Suspicious. Yeah, I just don't know if worms have eyes. Yeah. I don't know how they look, but yeah, they probably they probably don't see very well, seeing as they're under the ground most of the time. Yeah. Uh, just just moving on from from chickens, what would you suggest people need to know about the different types of eggs? So, same thing in terms of the categories. You have the cage free, free range, and pasture raised. All the all the things we just spoke about also apply to egg laying hens. But you also have the lowest category, which is no label. And those are hens typically grown in um, that live out their entire life in basically cages. And probably a lot of people have seen these, you know, they're like metal shoe boxes and they're basically like three or four hens in there at a time, like literally shoulder to shoulder, not able to move at all. And they live like that for their entire life for, for two years of their life. And usually after their egg laying hen days are over, they're usually processed into soups canned soups, which is why I stay away from chicken canned soups, and um, uh, various animal feed, you know, uh, dog food, cat food, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, because their body and appearance is so messed up at the end, there's no way you'll be able to sell that chicken at a grocery store, and anyone will buy that in their right mind. So uh, that one typically has no label. And that's usually indicative of, at least in the US, that it, it comes from these caged operations so that for sure you would want to stay away from for sure not being fed a species specific diet uh constantly being um given antibiotics for sure through the water supply most likely um fed gmo uh, corn and soy which is grown with a lot of glyphosate and a myriad of other chemicals whatever that crop production needs to needs to happen under artificial lights i mean the husbandry practices are pretty terrible uh, I feel really bad seeing any of those videos ever. And um, if you're much of a spiritual person, I mean, a lot of Native Americans would say, if you eat the flesh of a miserable animal, you will also inherit that misery as well. So if you kind of are a believer in the in that, that's something to consider as well. Yeah. I mean, the other thing with, with eggs is e- even, I mean, certainly in the UK, you can buy good quality eggs and they're not that expensive. They're not that there's not a lot of difference in the price between the worst quality egg and a good quality egg. And the amount of nutrient value you can get from an egg is very, very high per per gram or per pound. Um so yeah, that's definitely again, if someone's on a budget, good quality eggs is definitely a, a great option. As long as, you know, a lot of people there are a lot of people that are sensitive to to eggs, particularly egg whites, but you know, if you can 
if you can eat eggs and you've got no problem with them, it's, it's a really great source of, of, of nutrition. Yeah, and once again, the budget thing, that rule only applies to a very small minority of people. For sure, there are some people that genuinely don't have the money for that. Um, but they could also just buy, you know, maybe transition from no processed food to at least single ingredient factory farm food. It's already such a huge upgrade. And then maybe when, if it interests them, they'll figure out a way to make a bit more money and then kind of spend that little bit. Like you said, it's not even that much more at the end of the day. It all goes back to sick people can't make healthy decisions, you know, or they wouldn't be sick. And once they stop being mentally not well, they'll see that they're funding their own pathology and they have more than enough money to buy single ingredient organic food, especially at the grocery store level. Yeah, And it also comes back to, you know, the saying I, I've said a number of times on this podcast that Paul Check often uses, and it's the, it's Jerry Wesh's um, phrase of, you know, if you've got a big enough dream, you don't need a crisis. So oftentimes it's just someone doesn't have a big enough dream to change for. You know, if you've if you've got a if you've got a big a big dream, a big goal to aim for, then that can be enough motivation to create the change in your lifestyle to, to actually change what you're eating to, to to become interested in eating higher quality food. Yeah, that's true. There is there is that aspect to it too, but I think once again the bigger issue is the normalized pathology is first and foremost, the person isn't even consciously aware that they're living a life of mental and physical illness. And they're like, this is just how it is. They might not like it. I'm not saying they like it, but they just kind of submitted to this is how it is. And look at all my coworkers. They're the same way. Like, or the situation of like, I had, when I was giving grocery store tours, I had um, one engineer guy, 35, come up to me. He's like super overweight and on like two medical drugs, has like knee pain and back pain. And he's like, I've been eating all this factory farm stuff and going out and eating my whole life and I'm doing just fine. Meanwhile, once again, overweight on two medical drugs. And he might be in his mind doing fine because his coworker at the engineering firm is probably on like 10 medical drugs and like morbidly obese, not just obese, you know? Uh, so yeah, I mean, compared to that for sure, but both of them are doing beyond terribly, especially when you um, look back 10,000 years ago on the athleticism and the health and wellness of even an incompetent hunter and gatherer is probably already at pro level athleticism and health just naturally, you know, and to give you an idea, I mean, my grandmother, um, lived off grid her entire life. She lived to be 87 years old without going to the doctors a single time and was actually still physically active into her eighties, like able to move wood tend to animals, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You know, these days it's like, it's kind of tough to find a 20 year old male that's even athletic and, and not all full of toxins and all sorts of psychiatric drugs and stuff of that sort. I mean, 33% of, I think females in the U S are on a psychiatric drug, which is crazy. If you think about it, I mean, that that's when you know, uh, there's something seriously, seriously wrong. Yeah, and again, in a culture, I've spoken. I've had a number of guests on the show talking about the gut-brain axis and how you know if your gut microbiome is is imbalanced, that's going to affect the brain. It's going to affect the mind. And um, what affects the the gut microbiome more than anything else? It's your diet. Exactly, and yeah, like you mentioned, all the systems are interconnected of the human body. Once one system goes down, it kind of has a dragon effect on literally everything else. You know. I think Paul Cech always says like, oh, you know, what are you going to do like without your brain or without your heart or without your liver? You know what I mean? Like pretty much nothing. You need everything working. And it is easier and more straightforward than what most people think. But once again, we're so far detached from what health even means. Now it's actually complicated, especially with um, the addiction to symptom management approaches to healthcare, especially with a lot of like influencers online. You know what I mean? Uh, doing silly things like telling people that are struggling with weight, especially that are struggling with gaining and losing weight and having those cyclical patterns over and over again, that all they need to do is just work out more and eat better. You know, that's like telling a person with an alcohol addiction, they just need to stop drinking. Like, of course, on the surface, they do just need to stop drinking. But obviously, alcoholism is a symptom of a myriad of reasons that all need to be tackled with the appropriate amount of 
with the appropriate amount of intensity and attention to have that symptom just naturally dissolve on its own. But of course, you know, as you know, healthcare, it's obsessed with symptoms because that's how it gets its recurring client model, you know, and it's unfortunate that doctors also succumb to that. They see that a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them, um, they're not, they're not honest healthcare providers anymore. They're just glorified drug dealers, basically, you know, oh, you got high blood pressure. Here's, here's a drug. Like, let's not but the problem with that model is the belief system that le- led to the high blood pressure, even if you subdue the blood pressure and mask the symptom with a dangerous drug, basically, which has side effects in and of itself, uh, if that belief system that led to that issue isn't dealt with, it's obviously going to lead to a myriad of other health issues over your life lifetime. So what's your solution? Just being more and more drugged up, being a medical drug addict, basically? And a lot of people don't like it said that way. They're like, oh, it's medicine. I'm like, no, it's a drug. And the funny thing is, I got this from Jerry Kuykendall. If you read people, if you're like, hey, would you take this food and you read the side effects of the food, but really there are side effects of a popular pharmaceutical drug, they're like, no, I'll never eat that food. And I'm like, no, this is actually the drug you're taking right now. And they're like, oh, you know? So it's been so normalized, uh, especially this drug culture, you know, medical drug culture. It's just such a disgusting culture. And there are no absolutes. There are some... Uh, very uh, limited situations where that could actually help for sure, but it's maybe one in a few hundred cases. The other 399 cases out of 400 for sure, uh, they just need proper health education. They they need to stop living an unsustainable life. Completely agree. Next question I've got for you is about beef. You know, it's, it's quite interesting that more and more people seem to be turning to a carnivore diet. And obviously with that, a lot of people are just eating beef, maybe beef and eggs or beef, eggs and bacon. And that's that's their kind of entire entire diet. What can you tell us about different options with beef? Yeah, so beef, um, it's a bit more straightforward than chickens. You don't have as many different like departments, you can say. Uh, but it is a bit confusing still. So first, you have two main categories. One is the grain-finished beef, and one is the legitimate grass-finished beef. And I'm saying legitimate because it actually is tough to find legitimate grass-finished beef. But I will give people resources, at least that they can find in the U.S., and they can use those as a blueprint if they're living in the U.K. So um, 98% of cattle in the U.S. are grown on quote-unquote factory farms. So ironically, though, 80% of cattle's life, no matter the operation, is spent on pasture. Right. So they spend pretty much all of their life on pasture. But then the last 20% or so, they're said, sent to a feedlot. So this is typically what people see in documentaries like cattle shoulder to shoulder in a huge open space and caged in some kind of uh, cage or something of that sort. And obviously, remember when you, when the animal can't go to the food, you have to bring the food to the animal. What's the cheapest food that gets them to grow the fastest grains, right? And it's subsidized by the government to 80% of the cost of an operation are grains. And the cattle are fed these grains. And then uh, you can fatten them up quite a bit. But once again, it's not their species-specific diet. That's very important. The animal has to be given a species-specific diet if you, A, want them to be healthy, B, uh, want their nutritional profile to be optimized and, and and maximized, okay? So um, when they're fed grains, once again, it's a lot of the same issues. The omega-3 to omega-6 ratio loses its balance. So like on five bar beef, um, the meat analysis, we had a ratio of one to one, one omega-3 to one omega-6, which is its natural species-specific ratio, somewhere close to that. In a lot of these factory farmed operations, you're getting like one to 15, one to 20 omega-6s, Okay. Um, of course, you know, there are other big culprits like seed oils and processed food typically has really high omega-6s. I'll first start with getting rid of a lot of those to decrease your omega-6 quantity if that's a concern. But from a beef perspective, our conversation here, uh, that would be another source of omega-6s in terms of the ratio of omega-3 to omega-6. So you might have an issue with the amyloid buildups as well we talked about before. Obviously, a lot of cattle are giving given a lot of synthetic hormones too, usually as an estrogen pellet in their ear. 
antibiotics, beta agonists sometimes as well. So you got to take that into consideration. Um, a lot of the beef, at least in the U.S., it could also say uh, product of the USA. But what does that even mean? It means it's just processed in the USA. So I can get beef from like Brazil, JBS, import the carcasses in the U.S., you know, process them up in the factory, put them in packages, and it's still legally product of the USA. So it's tricky, you know? You're like, oh, in a customer's mind, if it says product of the UK, you think grown, manufactured, processed in the UK. You know, that's obvious. And it is actually the case with other meat products. So if it's like chicken, if it says that, then it, <laughs> then it is actually a, a product of the USA. So just to give you the idea of how confusing it's gotten, um, with grass-fed operations, Legitimate grass-fed operations, so grass-fed, grass-finished, 100% grass-fed. I would like to look for the American Grass-Fed Association certified logo, or you just know the rancher personally. That's always a good good option too. And there, uh, they are on pasture pretty much throughout all of their life, and they're fed a, a species-specific diet, herbivore diet. They're foraging on a lot of just grasses. And the larger the variety of the grass on the, on the pasture to or the forage, the greater the nutritional profile. The smaller the variety of the grass, uh, the lesser the nutritional profile of the cattle. So when you want to maximize it, in fact, that's the study I teamed up with um, Jason Runtry at uh, Michigan State University to do. So we're going to be looking at uh, various grazing practices and biodynamic farming practices and how they impact the nutritional profile of the beef and uh, in various markers there. So we just kind of uh, met about a week ago or so, and I walked over through their facility, and we're still kind of drawing up blueprints of how to do that. But that's our emphasis, to learn how to uh, develop like a, a, a rough copy and paste model of how to optimize the nutritional profile of the beef for health consumption of the, of the U.S. citizen, but also how to replenish the earth at the same time which you could do with, once again, these biodynamic farming practices where you have a combination of animals and farming, uh, which, once again, vegetarians are like super, super against. But that's the only way to really naturally replenish the soil without having all these crazy external inputs, which then make it more expensive to operate and rely more on industries that typically aren't sustainable or good for the environment. Um, so for the listeners, just go to americangrassfed.org. I think that's a great website, and you'll be able to have a good rundown of what to look for and what a legitimate grass-fed operation looks like. Because at least in the U.S., the labeling laws are kind of tricky. So, like, I can be, I can sell my grass-fed beef as grass-fed, grass-finished, but here's where the trick is: I can feed them grass for like eight months, put them on grains for like two months, finish them on grass for like a week and still sell it as grass-fed and grass-finished, you see? And I'm kind of not lying to you. Um, also, there's just very little oversight. It's mostly kind of like paperwork. So you want to be a grass-fed supplier, you just submit some paperwork. No one checks on your operation. And okay, you're a grass-fed supplier. Um, but if it's an AGA ranch, AGA certified ranch, uh, they will actually go and inspect it on site once every 15 months. And the reason they do it once every 15 months is to see the operation every single season. Because sometimes in certain seasons, you could be a legitimate grass-fed operation, but in other seasons, you can't. And they want to make sure you could actually do it every single season. That's important too. Yeah. In terms of uh, pork, again, could you explain the different ways in which they're raised and what would be the best and the worst options with, with regards to health? <laughs> Yeah, pork, uh, once again, omnivores, okay? So they need a, a variable diet. Uh, unfortunately, you're not going to, at least all of the states I've been in the U.S., you're not going to find legitimate pasture-raised pork at the grocery store level, okay? So this is definitely needs to be attained from some kind of, uh, you can go to eatwild.com. You will find legitimate pasture-raised operations there. And then with those operations, you just have to ask the right questions, you know? Um, and the cool thing is, is a lot of these ranchers will let you see, they actually have tours of their ranches. So you can come check it out. And it's usually scheduled on their website. So it's not, you just show up and then they kind of show you around, 
which is huge too, because a lot of these factory farmed operations, they're not going to let you do that. Okay. For a reason. But in my opinion, it's like, if you're running such a great operation, why not show it off? You know, what's there, what's there to hide, obviously. So with the uh, grocery store pork, it's like something I tend to stay away from for sure. It's very, very hard to find really good quality pork, you know? Uh, so it's definitely, in my opinion, not going to be found at the grocery store. Uh, it's moreover going to be found at the small rancher level. And at the small rancher level, I'll just ask what kind of feed they're feeding the, the pork. They're for sure going to be feeding them feed, but hopefully it's like organic feed. Some seasons they can do it. Some seasons they can't. Most popular option is they definitely always feed them non-GMO grains, which is still a great step in the right direction. And then you just have to uh, inquire about how that specific rancher is operating. You know, um, Joel Saladin, great resource. You can see uh, he has a uh, pork operations as well. You can see what he's doing and use that as a blueprint. He has a bunch of videos. So you can see what he's doing and he's talking throughout the videos. And then just ask those same questions to your rancher in your area. That's great. And can you explain the different options we have? buying fish and the potential harms of, of certain fish? Yeah, so fish, I personally just try to stay with wild-caught fish. Uh, the good thing is, is about fish is it's, it's much more clear, at least at the U.S. grocery store level. So say farm-raised fish or say wild-caught fish. And there are also just a lot of varieties that aren't farm-raised. So if you're worried about uh, contamination of that sort, you can just eat those varieties and they're not even at commercially available on a farmed operation, for example. But with fish, the labeling is still a little bit tricky sometimes. So sometimes a lot of times they'll say Atlantic salmon and I'll have a fish jumping out of uh, some water at a picture and people think, oh, that's from the Atlantic Ocean, obviously. That's what that name implies. But Atlantic salmon really does mean farmed salmon. Pretty much 99.9% .9 of the case, the time, maybe in certain parts of Ireland, actually, the UK, they do sell legit Atlantic salmon. Maybe they do. Uh, but basically, it's the same problems we talked about in all the other operations. Extreme confinement. Um, these operations usually are on shore or they're in warehouses and like big kind of swimming pool looking areas. Um, or rarely, they are sometimes out in oceans. I've seen a few of those operations, but I don't know if they're like pilot studies. I don't know if anyone really are doing those kind of operations, but typically they're on shore. Uh, your audience can check out a really good documentary called Norwegian Salmon, the most toxic fish in the world, which was a surprise for me when I first saw it because you would think Norway, it always looks so clean. You know, it's always up there in the north, like untouched by industry. But you will see what kind of pollution these operations are doing on their streams and how that's also contaminating the wild fish population as well, and actually kind of killing them off and ruining their natural migration uh, patterns as well, and stuff of that sort. So you get a lot of the same stuff. You get containment. When you have containment and the animal can't go to the food, the food has to be brought to the animal. What's the cheapest source of food? Uh, usually it, it is fed a lot of corn and soy, but it's usually mes meshed with smaller food. And the preservative, because they have actual uh, smaller fish there in the pellets, uh, it has to be basically, um, what's the call? What's the word um, to increase the shelf life? So, yeah, I don't buy processed food for so long, man. I forgot even the name. Preservatives, yes. Uh, so they use a lot of intoxicine. So intoxicine developed by Monsanto, it's an amino acid that's used as a preservative. So the thing is, the tricky part is it can't be fed directly to humans. but they found a workaround where they use these on pellets that are fed to fish. But then remember, anything that your food is exposed to, you're going to be exposed to. So the fish then build up the intoxicant in their tissue, and then you end up eating it as well. So that's something to consider as well. Yeah. And then wild caught, obviously, that's what I go for most. In fact, um, this year I've been doing a experiment. So I actually didn't start it in the beginning of the year. I think it was around April or so. And basically, I'm just eating elk, deer, uh, grass-fed bison and grass-fed beef, and wild fish, and that's it. So see, trying to get away as much as possible from farming altogether. 
And luckily, it's very easy to farm here, uh, not farm, but hunt here in Texas. So that does make it easier. I'm not a full-time hunter, obviously, so I still buy a lot of my meat. But I do get actual uh, portion of the meat is from meat that I actually personally hunt around here. Awesome. Wow, Eugene, we've we've covered we've covered quite a lot today. It's um it's been really informative. What but what's next for you? I'm just living life one day at a time, man. Just um just learning more about hunting. I'm gonna be doing this project, this research project with Jason Runtry. Still continuing education like you, you know, trying to do my podcast as well, mainly to interview. I'm hoping to have you as a guest on my show eventually too. You said you had another book coming out soon. Just talking to interesting people, you know, trying to get away from, obviously I have a laptop and I'm on, on my phone, but trying to not rely too much on technology and an industry and stuff of that sort, just the bare minimum to really run my online business and uh, just really living, happy to be living this like minimalist lifestyle uh, as well. And that's about it. So nothing, nothing too crazy. Awesome. And, and where can people find you online? Uh, the website is truffkinathletics.com. I'm looking to change the name pretty soon. And then obviously, unfortunately, to the Instagram and, and Facebook and all that stuff, I'm hoping eventually to not not be using any of that stuff at all and just keeping my podcast. But um, I'm active on all those all those platforms awesome. as well. And I'll, I'll make sure all those links are, are in the show notes. Cool. Thank you, Lee. So that's all from Eugene and me for this week. But don't forget, you can join me same time, same place next week on the Radical Health Rebel podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Remember to give the show a rating and a review, and I'll see you next time.